Good morning. Good morning. 
That's much better. Hey, we want to take just a moment and welcome you. I just say we're glad you're here today. If you're joining us online, I want to say welcome uh, to you as well. Uh, I just want to say, hey, help yourself to the, the coffee, water, bagels, donuts out in the cafe area. Bring your stuff in here and just worship with us today as, as you just feel God leading you to worship. Our hope and prayer is that you experience the presence of God today and that you experience and hear today what you need to hear uh, from God. So we're excited about continuing our series through James. Um, the book of James has just been an incredible uh, book for us to walk through. It's a very practical book when it comes to uh, just our, our own walk, our own Christ-like walk. And so uh, today we'll, we'll continue that with James chapter 3. And just excited to uh, see what God is going to speak to us about through, uh, through Christy today. A couple of things that you need to be aware of going on in the life of our church. Uh, first and foremost is we have a very important date coming up, uh, September the 13th is our 10-year anniversary as a church. And, man, we are so excited. We're going to celebrate that day. Uh, it's just a cool time for us to celebrate. We'll be meeting together in one service that day. Uh, afterwards, we will have a, a picnic barbecue type of thing, uh, asking you to sign up for uh, food. You can sign up in the connection table out in the cafe area for, like, a vegetable dish, a salad, a dessert, whatever it is that you would like to bring. Uh, but that's going to be a fun time. You need to mark that date. Uh, on your on your calendars, we celebrate the the past, the present, and the future of what God is going to do uh, with us at, at Northbridge Church. Um, also, need to be aware that we have uh, T-shirts on sale. If you want a Northbridge T-shirt, you got one more week to sign up for that. You can sign up for that on our website. Uh, that ends, you said, Sunday night at midnight. Next Sunday night, midnight. So you have uh, another week to sign up for those if you want to purchase those, and you can do that through uh, our website. Uh, we have a Lead Her event. You've got a little card in your uh, handout that is coming to uh, Northbridge on September the 18th. If you want to sign up for that, uh, Scott, raise your hand. He's back uh, over there by the computers. You can sign up for that with uh, Scott over there. If you have just, you're like, Lead Her, what's Lead Her? Well, you can talk with Miss Christy right over here uh, after service today, and she'll be happy to uh, fill you in, or Holly can fill you in uh, if you uh, want to know a little bit more about what Lead Her is. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Uh, go ahead and stand to your feet. Um, if I miss one, catch it in here. Uh, go ahead and take a moment to greet somebody, okay? together.
Lift your hands. Lift your hands, oh saints of God. Lift up your hands. Sing for joy to the risen sun. Celebrate, celebrate the life that's been reborn in you. Celebrate the one who's making all things new. Hallelujah, Christ is king.
He's there in the dark. You're there in the dark of the night. While holding the sun and its light. Through the triumph and trials of life. There's no one beside you. Cause your voice comes from the stars by.
speak to us now as we open your word. And it's in your holy name. kind of a mess this morning, but in a good way. I think it's important for us to be reminded that when we're a mess, there's no better place to be, right? This series has been so good and so timely. You know, one of the things that I love most about our Heavenly Father is how he knows us so deeply and so intimately. He knows what we need before we know that we need it. And he is a God that does not change. Even when our circumstances change, (coughs) he remains consistent. And he remains true. And I don't know about you, but I need that reminder today. Does anybody else need that? He does not change. He loves you the same today that he did yesterday that he will tomorrow. And you know, this book, this study on James, it has rocked a lot of us, including myself, because it's a, it's a study and it's a book that challenges us to action. You can't listen to the words of the Apostle James. You can't listen to these, these pleadings of Jesus' little brother and not hear his complete love and adoration for God's people. He loves them, he loves us, and he's speaking into us saying, don't settle, keep going. I I, I read those five chapters kind of like a blog. (laughs) I think each of those chapters are almost like a blog post. They kind of stand individually. And if that was the case and you're just joining us, let me kind of catch you up on what you've missed so far. James chapter one, if it was a blog post, I think it would be entitled this, keep going. Keep going, don't quit. That's the message I needed to hear today. I camped in James chapter one this week because I needed that reminder. Life is going to be hard. You're going to have struggles. James doesn't say if you struggle, he says when you struggle. When we struggle, press on, keep going. Use your testimony, even in times when your heart hurts and it's broken, when when it's hard to understand and wrestle with it, keep going, don't. Stop. That's what James is imploring all of us. James chapter 2, last week, Mike talked about, and he talked about um, what it looks like for us to do more. And I think that's what we would challenge that, what we would title that blog post, do more, do something. In fact, Mike left us with kind of a haunting question last week. He said, can we do more? Can we? He said, I don't know. But can we? You know what? I took that to my quiet time this week. And I found myself doing something that I think a lot of us are probably guilty of. I find myself saying this with God, God, I can't do any more. I'm already doing so much. I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing that. So many times I think that we are using what we're currently doing, we're using our current level of activity to justify not letting God add to our plate, not letting God add additional activity to serve him. Here's what I discovered. I went into my week saying, God, I can't do anymore. I feel like I'm serving you to capacity. And about Wednesday, I felt like he started to change my heart a little bit. I felt like he started to kind of whisper to me in my quiet time, okay, Christy, you may be at capacity, but maybe some of those things that you're doing are things you don't need to be doing. Maybe some of those things you're doing, you can delegate to somebody else to do so you can focus on this or you can do more of this. That was challenging to me. I don't think any of us can ever say, I'm done, I'm at capacity. As long as we're here on this earth, as long as we're drawing in oxygen, as long as we are here taking up space and breathing, he has a plan and he has a purpose for us. And he has a mission for us. He has something he needs you to do. Do something is what James chapter two is telling us. And then we come to today, James chapter three. I think if we could title that as a blog post, I think it would be taming our tongues. It's all about what do we do with the words that we speak and and what is this thing that, that we have that has great potential? It's so small, our tongue, but it has amazing, amazing potential. We have to be accountable and aware of the words that we use and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Full transparency, complete disclosure before we get started. I struggle with this. I struggle in this area. I struggle with my words. I struggle when I get frustrated. I struggle when I get angry. I struggle. So as I've prayed and I've prepared and I've gotten ready for this message, 
my toes have become a little bit purple. I feel like God's kind of used this chapter to step on my toes a little bit, to remind me that every single one of us, that this isn't in an area where we're going to achieve perfection. And, and if you have your copy of scripture, let's dig right into it. James chapter 3. I'm going to be talking out of the New Living Translation. So if you have your tablet or your version app, if you want to pull up the New Living Translation, that's what's going to be on your screens. But verse 2 says this. It says, indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. And we could also control ourselves in every other way. A couple of words there that I need you to look at. All. All of us. All of us make mistakes. Nobody in this room can say, oh, this doesn't apply to me. I can turn this off today. I make no mistakes. Right? Am I wrong? Is there somebody? Okay. Just checking. Just making sure. Okay. And then it says this. It says if. It says if we could control our tongues. I love that James included the word if. He didn't say when we can control our tongues. He, he said if, because he recognizes we're human. We're human and our humanity is prone to sin. Our humanity is prone to imperfection. And he's telling us, you are going to struggle in this. All of us, young, old, non-believer, new believer, old believer, it doesn't matter who you are in life, how long you've been walking with Christ, how many times you've attended church, you are going to struggle with this. And it's important for us to just level the playing field right now to say, I struggle with this, you struggle with this. This is an area that we wrestle every single day. This is a battle for us because every single one of us, we are using words consistently, okay? I use a lot of words. I am a verbal processor. I, I, I need to talk things out. I need to think things through. I'm so grateful that God has given me Holly and, and Hannah and Allie at Lead Her that just listen to me sometimes, just go. And, and he's given me my husband who finally understands that I just need to talk about it. I don't need you to tell me how to fix it. I just need to talk about it. it took him a little while to learn that. It was a struggle for us. But I, I process out loud. Anybody else a verbal processor? A few? Okay. So here's what I thought was interesting. I did a little bit of research the last few weeks, and here's what I discovered. Would anyone like to guess, don't use your phones, no cheating, no Google, okay? Anybody want to guess, how many words do you think the average man speaks in a day? 3,000? Higher. Somebody in first service said 10 of their husband. I thought that was funny. Anybody got another guess? A little higher than three. 5,000? It's a little higher. It's actually 7,000 words, okay? Average male is speaking about 7,000 words in a day. Would anyone like to take a guess about how many words the average female is speaking? Two hundred. <laughs> Don may be a little above average. <laughs> Anybody else? Close. 30,000, a little high. 20,000. Okay, 20,000 is the average word that a female is speaking on a daily basis. So if we average the two together, okay, then we're talking around, roughly around 13,000 words that we're speaking on a daily basis. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of opportunities for us to speak truth, to speak life, to speak encouragement, to speak love into people. But guess what? It's also a whole lot of opportunity for us to say things that we're going to regret for us to say things in anger, for us to say things without thinking them through first. Does anybody else ever say anything that you regret? Say anything that you don't think about? We wrestle with that because constantly coming out of our mouth are all of these words. And that's what James is talking about here in James chapter three. Keep reading with me. We're gonna read verses three and six. Three through six, excuse me. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It has set a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it itself is set on fire by hell. Fire is an incredibly destructive force of nature. It can consume large acreage of forest fires. It can take down a house very, very quickly. Our words, a lot like fire, have the potential to be incredibly destructive and very damaging to our relationships, to our influence, to our witness. 
you know, our words do a lot of things. They communicate for us. They share our emotions. They also reflect the condition of our hearts. You can often tell what a person's heart is really like by the words that they speak, especially the words that they speak at home. We're really good sometimes uh, about becoming performers. When we know that people are listening, they're tuned in, man, we can tell people exactly what they want to hear. But if you really want to know the condition of somebody's heart, listen to the words that they're speaking in private. Listen to the words that they're speaking when they don't think anybody's listening. Our words also show us the strength of our character. Man. Have you ever known somebody that just has incredibly strong character, incredibly strong will? You often hear them speak words of strength, of resolve, of commitment, of determination. Our words reflect the strength of our character. Our words also show the priority in our lives. Many times, the things that you have as a priority are the things that we invest our money in, the things that we invest our time in, and the things that we talk about. You want to know what somebody's priorities are? Those are the three best places to look. Their date book, their checkbook, and listen to the words that they're speaking. Because what's important to them is what they're going to talk about. Their family, their friends, baseball, football, sports, politics, their job, their faith. What's important to them is often what's coming out of their mouths. Your words also show the authenticity of your faith. It is so easy it is so easy. And I think, honestly, this is what the Apostle James is talking about. It's so easy for us to come in here on Sunday mornings, to come in here and to sing beautiful worship music, to lift our hands and lift our voices and praise and say those words. It's easy for us to, to sit down and to pray. It's easy for us to say something when it's appropriate. But how do we behave when we leave this place? I, I know for our family, there's been times we didn't even make it to the car. There's been times we didn't even make it home. We didn't even make it to the restaurant before somebody was at it with somebody else. Words of anger, words of frustration, words of nastiness. Immediately, they're coming from our mouth. James goes on to say this. He says in verse 7, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one, nobody can tame the tongue. For it is a restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. That's what James is saying to us. That's what I'm saying to you. This isn't right. I'm saying it to myself because I know that I struggle with it, and I'm saying it to each of you. This isn't okay. It's not right. It hurt the heart of James enough that he wrote about it. How do you think it makes the heart of our Heavenly Father feel? When he sees us come into this place and lift up his name and walk out those doors and curse his people. Verse 11 says, Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. You know, James chapter 1 and 2, the first two weeks of this series, they are calling us to be people of action. They are calling us. In those messages, in those chapters, James is saying to us, church, don't just settle. Church, don't just come and listen. Church, don't just settle for routine-based faith. Don't just check it off because it's a routine. Don't just check it off because it's expected of you. Don't just open your Bible because it's expected. Don't just pray because it's expected. Don't just show up here on Sunday because it's expected. Do something. Do something with your faith. Let your faith transform you from the inside out. And as it transforms you from the inside out, be different. Act different. Behave different. Speak different. Speak different. You know, I'm an incredibly visual person. Some of you guys know that about me. Um, I try to do that when I teach. I try to do that when I write. I try to do that when I lead. And I also try to do that when I parent. There's a lot of times with my kids that they're struggling with a concept and, and I'm trying to explain it to them. I'm trying to make them see it. And I realize they just need something very tactile and very visual. A few years ago, we were having a real battle in our house where the kids were just, anybody have kids like that? They were fighting with one another. They were making unkind comments to one another. And it hurt my heart. It hurt my heart to watch them be mean to one another. 
And so finally, I'd, I'd been praying, God, man, how do I speak into this? How do I talk into this? And one day, I just felt like he gave me this image to share with him. And I ran out to the garage. I got a little piece of board, grabbed a couple of nails and a hammer. And I did this illustration with them. And, and it was so powerful that we actually have that board. It sits up in our kitchen. And it's been there for years now. And, and there are times when, when we have this going again, and they're being mean, and they're making poor choices with their words, that I literally will just walk over and point at the board. I don't have to say it anymore because they know exactly what I mean by that. So I wanna share this illustration with you today, okay? Imagine if you would, that this box of nails represents the words that we speak, okay? Now, full disclosure, when we were planning this, um, I texted my husband and I said, hey, do you think we could get about 27,000 nails to make a visual point for our sermon? And he texted me back, he's like, do you have any idea how many nails that is? And I was like, okay, well, how about an average of about 13,000? He's like, Christy, seriously, what would we do with that many nails? I'm like, well, you could build stuff. He was like, I couldn't use that many nails in my lifetime. So he told me to tell you to imagine that this is 27,000 nails. So anyway, that's what we're going to do. So here's what I did with the kids. Here's what I'm going to do with you this morning. Okay, I want you to imagine, if you would, that this piece of wood, okay, right here, that this represents your witness. Okay, personalize this. Okay, this isn't a general example for everybody. This is you right here in a board. Okay, this is your witness to the world. Okay, what happens when in a moment of frustration or in a moment of poor choices, we injure our witness? We add things to it. We drive nails into it. Let me show you what I mean. Has anybody ever spoken a word out of pride? That's one I know I struggle with. There's a lot of times that I find myself going, I don't need your help. I can do this by myself. I've got this. Seriously, please just let me figure this out. I've got this. And what I've come to discover in my life is that when I do that, a lot of times, number one, I'm robbing somebody else of a chance to be a blessing. Somebody else of a chance to help me, to use their giftings. But I'm also showing everybody around me in that moment, I'm teaching them self-sufficiency. I'm teaching them pride. I'm not teaching them to be loving. I'm not teaching them to allow people to help. I'm modeling pride in that moment. And you know what? It causes damage to my witness. I want you to think for a minute as we're doing this. Who are some of the people that see your witness? For me, kids, my husband, family, friends, people I work with, all of you. Who are those people for you that watch this every single day? Because what happens when one of those people see you make a promise? Maybe you make a promise to them that you're going to be there. Maybe you make a promise that you're gonna help with something. Maybe you make a promise or a commitment to be part of small group or to volunteer in some way, but you know what, you just end up and you're too busy or something else comes up or you just can't make that happen and that promise gets broken, that integrity gets damaged and it drives a nail into our witness. What about words of jealousy? I know I can be guilty of those. There are times in my life that it's really easy for, for me to kind of look longingly at different things. For me to go, man, I wish we had that car. Man, I wish we had that house. Man, I wish that I had you know, that pair of shoes or that, this, that. We can do that. But think about those people that you're influencing. Think about those people that you're impacting. Scripture tells us to be content in him, to want for nothing. So when, when we're constantly speaking words of longing that say, man, I wish I had this, man, I wish I had that, we're, what we're saying to those people that we influence with our witness and our words is I'm never satisfied. I'm never happy. I can get that and then guess what? I'm gonna turn right around and want something bigger and something better. What does that look like when people see you? You're supposed to be a believer. You're supposed to be content in Christ, but you just consistently are seeking after the world and nothing in the world is satisfying us. We put another nail in our witness. What about critical words? Anybody ever struggle with being critical? You know, I shared in first service, if you want a really great piece of parenting advice, but you know what? This doesn't just go for parenting. This goes for any relationship that you're in. Do not ruin a great compliment with a critical word. We are so good, church. We're so good at inserting that critical word at the end. Man, you know what? You played great today, but you missed that one thing. 
Or you know what? You did such a great job on that paper, but you did this, this, and this. We're constantly critical. And here's the thing. I'm critical of myself. And I know that. I've told you guys that from the platform before. I am my own worst enemy. I'm incredibly critical of myself. I tend to be an extreme perfectionist. But because I'm critical with myself, I often turn that onto other people. And I start to expect more of them. And and I start to consistently be pushing them to be better instead of sometimes just letting that sit and be like, man, I'm so proud of you. You did a great job. And just let that be and come back with feedback and constructive criticism at a different time in a different place so I don't distract from that. Drive a nail. How about words that are spoken without tact? Sometimes we can have the greatest of intentions and the words that we speak are very appropriate. They need to be said. But sometimes if we say them with a bad attitude, if we say them with a rude look on our face, sometimes if we're just not tactful, sometimes it's just the moment that we speak the word. Maybe the word needs to be spoken, but just not right that second. Some of us struggle with that, myself included sometimes. And when I do that and I'm not being tactful, I drive another nail. We're losing them. How about words of gossip? I think one of the things that always hurts my heart is, have you ever gone out to lunch on a Sunday afternoon? So many times you see them and you know they're coming in from church and they sit down and and I've overheard them. I've participated in it myself. 90% of the conversation is about gossip. This person did this, and did you see what that person was wearing? And man, I can't believe this. Did you hear that? Sometimes I wonder, what do the people that hear us think? And, And as a church body and as believers, you know what? Let's be really honest. We're really good at gossiping. But a lot of times we try to spiritualize it and call it prayer requests. We try to say, hey, did you hear that this is going on with so and so? And da 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 da. And 10 minutes later, you should really pray for them. I, you know what? Here's the deal. Point A and point C. You can cut out the middle. We don't have to know all the details. God knows the details, right? I can say, hey, did you know that something's going on with this person? I just really want to ask you to be praying for them, period. We don't have to share it. It's not our story to share. And when we do, we drive a nail. How about cursing? How many times... Have we been places? We've been at sporting events. We've, we've been in traffic. We've been somewhere and we lose our temper and a word flies out of our mouth that would make our mothers blush. It happens. It happens. We say it and we can't bring it back. It's out there. But you know what? I've heard so many people say, well, I just use it for emphasis or when I'm really trying to make a point. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. And it takes away from our witness. What about words of unforgiveness? That's one I'm struggling with right now. In Lead Her this month, our topic for all of our chapters across the country is forgiveness. And it's not been an easy topic for me. Sometimes I struggle because I don't want to forgive. It's hard. Or sometimes I feel really entitled to the words that I need to speak. Sometimes I feel really entitled to the hurt that I want to hang on to. But you know what? Scripture tells us again and again to forgive, to let go. And when I refuse to speak words of forgiveness, and instead I'm speaking words that are only driving those nails in deeper, making those hurts even harder, making those roots go even further down, I not only hurt myself, but I influence others around me to say, well, why do I need to forgive? You're not going to forgive. You know, an area where that's really evident is with your children. Because it's really easy sometimes for them to look at your situation and say, I don't understand. Why do we need to forgive that? But for you to sit down and say, we forgive it because he forgave us. We forgive the unexcusable in others because God forgave the inexcusable in us. You model that and you show that. And when we don't, we hurt our witness. How 
about words of anger? Has anybody ever lost your temper before? Nobody? Wow, okay, a few. All right. So I think what happens a lot of times, we get angry, and that anger like flips a switch somewhere deep inside of us, and it just goes, because when we get angry, we say things that, first of all, we can't take back. But second of all, we say things that we would never say in any other circumstance or situation. We become so defensive and so mean. We're, we're like backed into a corner and we just spew right here. When we are angry, our words have the potential to do great damage. Here's another one. How about disrespect? I have teenagers at home right now. Disrespectful words. But we don't grow out of it, right? Even as adults, we can do it. Even as adults, we don't like the way that our boss made a decision. We don't like the way that that person's driving. We don't like the the call that that referee just made. And instead of being respectful, we choose to be ugly with our words and we choose to spew things out that hurt our witness. I don't know about you, but as I look at all of these, there's a piece of me that's tempted to just never speak again. I'm tempted to go, well, you know what? I'm better off just to keep my mouth closed because if I'm going to speak, something's probably going to get said that's wrong and I'm going to hurt my witness, so I'm better off just to close my mouth. But here's the thing. We're called to speak truth. We're called to speak love. We're called to speak encouragement again and again. Genesis to Revelation, we are told to not be quiet, but to speak up and to speak in love, to share his truth, to challenge the world. So this one, this nail, let this represent for us what it looks like when we avoid things. Because a lot of times, guys, I think that God's calling us to tough conversations, He's calling us to confront somebody in love. He's calling us to have that difficult confrontation. He's calling us to say to somebody, you know what, I'm noticing something here and I just want to challenge you with your words. But when I don't do that because I'm afraid of what I'm going to say or I'm I'm afraid of what they're going to say and I avoid that situation altogether, I'm just as guilty. We have to be accountable not only for the words we speak, but also the words we won't speak. So imagine with me that this represents your witness. You know, a lot of times when I look at this, I think that, man, there's still a lot of space there. There's a lot of good stuff that's happening there. The rest of this is filled up with, you know, great encouragement, with with words that are life-giving. I'm doing a great job. I mean, really, there's only probably nine or ten nails here. That's not too bad. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, to a watching world, to the people who are impacted by your influence, to the people who live with you, who do life with you, who do leadership with you, to the watching world, what they remember are the pieces that stand out. What they see and what they focus on and what hurts them are these pieces right here. These nails that stick out in your influence, these nails that stick out in your witness, guys, these are the places where your witness gets hung up. These are the places that your influence gets caught on. These are the places that that your grace that you're trying to model through the world gets snagged because it's just hanging there. It's just hanging out there and, and it's not something that lines up with everything else. You know, James goes on to tell us In verse 13, he says this. He says, if you are wise and you understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that come from wisdom. Humility that comes from wisdom. Here's the deal. It takes wisdom to look at your life and find your snags. It takes wisdom to look at your witness and see where your influence is getting hung up. It takes wisdom that only can come from your Heavenly Father. This is where you need to get on your knees before your Father, and you need to say, God, I know I'm making mistakes. I know I speak words that aren't glorifying. I know that I speak words that do damage to my witness. Will you show me where they are? 
Will you show me what's getting caught on them? Will you show me what relationships that they've caused damage to? When you seek him, scripture tells us in Jeremiah, it tells us in Isaiah, it tells us again and again, if you seek him for wisdom, he will provide it. So I challenge you today, church, to be willing to go to him and say, hey, I need your wisdom. Father God, I need you to show me, give me your perspective of what my witness and my life looks like through your eyes and show me where I'm falling short. Show me where I've messed up. Show me what nails are sticking out that I need to address. And here's the thing, we can't stop there. A lot of us would like to. We would like to stop and say, okay, I see them, but boy, I don't wanna deal with them. That's not easy. But James tells us that it takes humility to address them. And here's what that looks like. That looks like me going to somebody who I've broken promises to and telling them I'm sorry. And admitting that I did wrong telling them that I'd overcommitted, telling them that I didn't think clearly or I didn't pray about it before I committed to that and asking them to forgive me. Sometimes it means that, that I need to go to my Heavenly Father and I need to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the times that I have longed after and continuously asked for more and more and more from you instead of just being satisfied in what I have. Will you forgive me? And will you help me to do better? Will you help me to be more grateful for what I've got? And help to discipline me so that I'm not constantly asking you and and telling everyone else of what I'd rather have than what I have right now. Sometimes maybe that humility means that you need to go to somebody and and you need to say, you know what? I really lost my temper with you. I I said some things that I wish I could take back. I'm really sorry. I hope that you will forgive me, and I hope we can work on it going forward. Sometimes humility looks like going to somebody and saying, you know what, I've been avoiding something for a really long time. I've been avoiding a tough conversation with you, and I know that I need to have it, not necessarily because I want to have it, but because God's asking me to have it with you. You know, notice something. First of all, I didn't get them all. I'm not asking you to leave here today and make a list of every word you have ever spoken incorrectly in the last 10 years. Make a list of everyone you've ever offended and every curse word you've ever spoken and every broken promise. I'm not asking that, and guess what? Neither is God. He's he's not asking you to go one by one by one by one. He's asking you to say, man, I need to do a better job in this area. And starting today, help me to be more intentional with that. Maybe he's asking you to say, I I need to recognize and go in humility after you've granted wisdom. I need to pull out some nails. But you know what? Notice something. It's not a magic board. It didn't self-heal itself. Those holes are still there. Those holes are still there. Just like in a relationship, you can go and you can apologize for the words that we say, but guess what? The pain and the hurt, the memory, it's still there. We have to recognize that when we speak out of anger, out of frustration, when we say things quickly, when out of our mouth comes both fresh water and salt water, we are, we're driving nails that leave holes. And it is so important that that we learn, I, I started using this prayer several years ago in my life. Because I'll be really honest and incredibly transparent with you, for many, many, many years of my life, I had a serious problem with my tongue. I still do, but I had a really bad problem. My mother is in this room and she has heard me say things to her that were horrible. I have said things that have hurt people. I have said things that have offended people. But you know what? Over the last few years of my life, as God has just continued to do a work on me and in me, he's convicted me of those places. And sometimes I have had to go back. There's been conversations when I've called her up, especially after my daughter let me have it, and I said, oh, I get it now, and I am sorry. There have been people that I wronged years ago that I've had to say, you know what? I'm sorry that I said that. I'm sorry that I hurt you. And in doing that, I not only remove a nail and acknowledge a hole, but I think that as we acknowledge those holes, we reflect God's holiness. God isn't asking for your perfection. Please understand that. On Wednesday nights, we've been gathering together at the the office across the parking lot, 
We've just been talking more in depth about this series on James. And in first service, Jim was here, Jim McDonald. And one of the things that he said Wednesday night was, you know what? I know that I can't be perfect. I know that I can't be perfect, but I do know that I can make progress. And it was so wise, so profound. And it's exactly what we're talking about here. I'm not asking you to be perfect in your words. God's not asking you to be perfect, but he's asking you to make progress. And where you've messed up, use those mistakes Use those holes to let his glory shine through and let his holiness be reflected. You know, James isn't done with us. He tells us this. He says in um, verse 18, he says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. James is echoing the words of his older brother, Jesus. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will inherit the earth. There is something about being willing to invest in a peacemaking process. It takes time, it takes energy, and it takes our words being changed to do that. It's not easy, but when we do that, it's like taking putty, and it's like lovingly filling in those holes with something else. It's filling them in with encouragement. It's filling them in with apologies. It's filling them in with prayers, with life-giving words. This board may never fully be the same again. It'll still be marred. If we really get close and examine it, we're going to be able to see where the petty marks are. But you know what? If you think about what the word sincere really means in ancient, in ancient Greek, when, when we're told to be sincere believers, that was being used to refer to a process when they had a clay, a, a clay pot that was shattered and they would put it back together. They would use this clear wax and that clear wax would hold the pot back together. But then when you held it up to the light, you could clearly see where all the cracks were. That was a sincere pot. This makes us sincere believers. You can see where we messed up, but praise God that he's good enough to love us despite our mistakes. He uses them and he continues to give us opportunity as we go forward. Guys, it's not easy. James knew it wasn't easy and that's why he told us nobody is gonna get this perfect on this side of eternity. As long as we're here, as long as we are speaking, as long as we are, are striving to be more and more like Jesus, we're gonna wrestle with our words. We're gonna struggle. But as long as you are here, you are influencing somebody. You're impacting somebody with your words and with your actions. So you cannot be haphazard with them. Your words need to be spoken prayerfully and carefully and intentionally. And you need to recognize before you speak them the impact that they are capable of. It is so incredibly vital. And I promise you this, when you start to change the words that come out of your mouth, when you start to learn to discipline yourself, to sometimes just not say anything. Maybe I just need to spend some time in prayer before I respond. Maybe I just need to, to be silent instead of just throwing out whatever's coming to my mind. As you start to learn to do that and you enter into this relationship where you give God permission to change that in you and to work on that with you, when you change the words that you speak, you change the direction of your life, your leadership, your relationships, your influence. Everything can hinge on your words. I challenge you to think of those people. Who are those people closest to you that are in your home, that you work with, that you live next to, that you do life with? Let me assure you of this. If you will make a commitment to start to be more intentional with your words, to start to be more prayerful and careful with the words that you speak, the people who will be most influenced and most impacted by that change are those people because they're gonna notice it immediately. They're gonna notice when you don't just give a, a sarcastic retort. They're gonna notice it when you don't just spew out anger and, and vileness. They're gonna notice it when you withhold words of condemnation or judgment. They're gonna notice it when you're not engaging in gossip anymore. You're words influence. Are they life-giving? Are your words driving and making holes? Or are your words filling holes? That's what I want you to wrestle with this week. In fact, 
I'm going to invite you to wrestle right here this morning. I don't think that this is a message that we can just wrap up with a neat little bow and say, okay. I think this is a message where we really just need to say, God, I'm asking you through the power of your Holy Spirit to please show me. Bring conviction where it needs to be brought. And I pray that you just show me where do my words hurt people? Where have my words hurt my witness? Where, where are my words causing damage instead of bringing glory? And so I want to ask you, this morning, as the band comes and plays our final song, I want to invite you to use the front of this stage this morning just as an altar. If you're listening to this message and you're like me and me and your toes are just starting to get a little sore, maybe you just need to get on your knees in front of your Heavenly Father and you just need to say, I've messed up here. I recognize it and I want to do better. Maybe you just need to come and say, I, I know a very specific situation and a very specific person where I need to do a better job with my words. And you just need to pray about that situation to God. I'm going to challenge you to do that and use this time this morning. But I'm also going to challenge you to do this. Even if you don't feel led to come down here and pray, I'm going to ask that every single one of you, before you leave today, to grab one of these. It's a nail tied onto a string. It was a very fun date night at my house last night. Um, but I want this to be a reminder to you. I don't know where you need to put this, but I suggest you put it in a place where you are often tempted with your words. Maybe that's on the rear view mirror of your car if you struggle in traffic. Maybe that's on your, on your mirror when you're getting ready in the morning to just be praying about the words you speak that day. Maybe it's on your keychain. Maybe you tie it around you as a necklace. I don't know what you need to do with it, but I promise you, if you will ask God where that place is, he'll show you. Maybe you need to set it on your desk at work. I don't know what that looks like. But I know that if you will use this little nail as a reminder to you that your words have influence and impact and you will commit to using them differently, to stewarding them differently, things will start to change. Relationships will start to change and your relationship with him will start to change. Let's pray. Father God, not easy to take a look at places where we've caused pain. It's not easy to take a look at places, God, that, that we've created holes and that we've done damage. But God, it's important. It's important because, Father God, we cannot be people who turn a blind eye. We need to be men and women who recognize the capacity that we have to be used by you in our actions and in our speech. And so, God, I just pray in this place, in these next few minutes, God, that you will just speak to hearts in a deeply personal way. God, I ask that, that you will bring conviction where it's needed but you will bring it in love. Those words don't disqualify us from relationship with you. They don't disqualify us from being used by you. You just simply ask that we continue to commit to do better. And so God, I pray that you give us the strength to do that. Give us the wisdom to see where we need to make changes, God, and give us the humility and the boldness to move. In your name we pray.
today. I know we have been challenged. Thank you for that, uh, that message uh, through God's spirit, Christy. Uh, man, what a powerful time. Again, just another example of just the practicality of James. I mean, it, he has a way of just kind of hitting us between the eyes, but it's a very practical uh, thing and things that we talk about and we, as our, we look at our walk in, in Christ. So, man, I hope you've been challenged. Take today, meditate on it, pray about it. Um, you know, if there's someone else that you'd like to speak with, if there's someone you want to pray for you or with you, Chris, you'll be hanging out here uh, for a little bit after service. I will be as well. Uh, we'd be happy to talk with you if you need someone to talk to. If you're visiting with us, uh, man, we'd love to know you're with us. We'd love to uh, uh, send you a card of encouragement or connect with you in any way we could. Uh, take a moment to fill out this card that was in your handouts, your connection card. You can drop that in the Giving Center over in the um, uh, Connection Center um, out in the cafe area. So go ahead and stand to your feet if you would. God bless you.
Take me far away from him There is no better loss than to lose my 